Good evening, everyone. Hello. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Eugenia Wu. I'm the president of the board of Dokomomo US WeWa. And so happy you're here today. And I'm really excited about our speaker, Kristen Potterton. And also joining us today is Tyler Sprague, who is a fellow board member and also a recent past president of Dokomomo WeWa. And also, um, he is a professor of architecture at the University of Washington. He's been working with Kristen. So he's gonna kind of introduce the project and introduce Kristen. So um, I'm excited you're all here today. I, we're just gonna get started. Just a few things. We're going to um, take uh, questions at the end. And so if you can please type your questions into the chat and we'll have time for Q and A um, near the end. And then we'll we'll read the questions and Tyler will moderate and and we'll go from there and then I'll wrap things up um, near the end and we should be done just around 8 p.m. And so um, I just want to say that we we're really excited that Kristen was working with us this summer. Um, for those of you familiar with our website, you know that we have about 160 architects and designers biographies on our site, and which is a great resource. Um, but it also you know, it's also lacking in terms of representation. Um, there are very few women biographies, uh, very few people of color. And so we are working to um, do more research and documentation and to get more um, underrepresented stories up on our website. And so that's really important to us. And so this is part of that effort as well. Um, and so um, I well, and uh, Tyler, if you want to take it from here. Um, so just uh, before Tyler, you can do it. Um, again, I can mention if you uh, please mute your microphone. Um, so only Tyler, Kristen and I should have our microphones on. And uh, again, type your questions into the chat and we'll go from there. Uh, thank you. Great. All right, thanks, Eugenia. Yeah, I'm excited today to hear our presentation as well from, from Kristen. Kristen is a PhD student in the College of Built Environments, and like many of us here, interested in the, in the, uh, the history of the modern architecture of the region and telling broader stories about modernism than have been told traditionally. So this is the second series in a row of, of Docomomo sponsoring a short summer research program last year with focusing on the architect Benjamin McAdoo and this summer focusing on Northwest women in design and as Eugenia said really an effort to diversify the voices that are represented on our Docomomo website. So Kristen has produced several new modern places entries that allow you to locate places on a map as well as providing new new profiles and so today we've asked her to just summarize her findings to uh, to say you know um, sort of recap what she was able to do over the summer and what her sort of big takeaways from studying these significant designers in our region. It's always nice to have fresh eyes look at people that we may know and use that as just an excuse to bring them back into our modern conversation. So we're excited to host Kristen tonight and the conversation that that will follow. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen and let her take it away. Thank you, Tyler and Eugenia. Um, uh, as I said, <laughs> I am, my name is Kristen and I am a PhD student at the University of Washington. And I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you and the, the chance to come on when we walk in over the summer to investigate some of the women design professionals working regionally in the modern era. And while I expect that many of you listening will know most of the kind of overview given today, I, I hope this can also be seen as an opportunity for me to present my perspective on their personal and professional lives and um, maybe a, an opportunity to reconsider why we should continue to tell their stories now. So why I'm interested in this, I grew up um, on California Central Coast, and so as a child, and again in college, I remember visiting Hearst Castle multiple times. So I grew up in a, an environment where I knew the name Julia Morgan, and I recognized her. 
And it wasn't until more recently, after I've spent more than a decade working professionally um, as a structural engineer, I was speaking with a, a junior colleague, a junior female engineer, and she confessed to not knowing who Julia Morgan was. <laughs> and that made me kind of realize how privileged I had been in learning about design in a context where I knew even the names of women designers. So that conversation and the return to an academic environment in order to pursue a PhD at the University of Washington made me realize that we should be speaking about the women who helped design and build our communities, both to have examples of female designers for students and young professionals and to recognize their professional contributions alongside the men who are a more familiar piece of the story. And so tonight I'm just highlighting a very small number of those women um, so, and I don't expect it to be a full story of their work or their life, but maybe just brief looks into their, their work and careers. So looking at the Pacific Northwest and the European settlement of the region, we know that there are women pioneers helping to shape and develop the region from the beginning. Mother Joseph Garceau, a Canadian nun, was one of the earliest. She came to the Pacific Northwest as a missionary, and she led a small contingent of nuns from Montreal to Vancouver in 1856. And by 1859, the sisters had purchased property and were building on the site in Vancouver. Uh, Mother Joseph supervised the construction of permanent buildings on their site and is often also considered responsible for the design of at least some of those buildings. Ultimately, she would oversee the design and construction of several hospitals, schools, and orphanages across the Pacific Northwest, including the now demolished Providence Hospital here in Seattle. In 1980, uh, the state of Washington chose to honor her contributions as one of the two state statues in the US Capitol's National Statuary Hall collection. She's one of only 11 women subjects in the collection currently. So I think that just highlights, <laughs> even though it was a very small, maybe in the grand scheme of design and construction, how critical you know, even a few buildings can be to the developer, development of a region. Almost a counterpart to this is uh, Catherine Lockwood Squire, and she entered architecture perhaps more traditionally through an apprenticeship and later worked on her own as a mechanical draftsman and residential designer. She's recognized as the first woman to enroll in the, the Cooper Union's architecture program, although she only completed one year of study. She moved west in the 1880s and in 1887 was hired by the Tacoma Building and Savings Association to modify builder ready plans for members. She was also hired to design other residences in Tacoma, but ended up leaving the region in 1888 uh, due to her second husband's health. Even with that brief time in the region, she is credited with the design of almost 30 buildings in Tacoma. And so these two women, I think, are admirable, admirable pioneers um, regionally, and perhaps their work is not highly recognized. It may be because they did not aim to contribute to the broader building professions beyond their own work. I think it's still an important basis to understand, you know, individual women working in these fields, um, even as the region was just starting to develop. And next, we're moving on to some perhaps more familiar names, uh, beginning with Elizabeth Eder, who would become Washington State's first female licensed architect. She was born in Olympia and graduated from Olympia High School in 1916. And she would later state that she enjoyed art and math and partially decided to pursue studying architecture because she had been told that women couldn't be architects. And in 1921, she became the first woman to graduate from the architecture program at the University of Washington and the fourth from the program overall. After post-graduation travel, she returned to Seattle to work under Edward Malibu and she Collaborate, collaborated with them primarily on residential work, including designs in the Highlands, Laurelhurst, and Magnolia, generally in traditional architectural styles. 
She later considered her work during this period as some of her favorite projects, uh, including the Seattle Children's Home, as well as the Henry C. Linden residence in the Highlands, which is pictured here. In the archival documentation for this project, it's, there's notes on some of the drawings that indicate that she did much of the drawing for the project, including this set of stair details. And I think that just shows, of course, the artistry and skill that goes into um, creating these, these drawings during this period. During her career, her designs continued to highlight traditional architecture design, both in large projects and perhaps more importantly, more um, modest designs, which I think contributed to the region just as, as much as the larger ones. They are often accomplished in um, colonial styles, like this single family home in Laurelhurst, which, at least from the exterior, appears to retain many of its original features. And she would go on to partner with other women in her work, including landscape architects and contractors. Era participated in several women's organizations and professional groups, including the AIA. She also served on the Seattle Board of Adjustments from 1957 to 1970. And as part of the Board of Adjustments, she participated in the decision-making process for zoning variances, ranging from the Space Needle and flagpoles on residential lots to a lion being kept in a residence, as well as the more mundane lot line variances and sign approvals. Uh, alongside these active professional and service interests, Air was still in some ways, I think, a product of her generation. After her fellow Board of Adjustment members asked her to become a chair in 1962, it was noted in the Seattle Times that she declined because she felt the position should be held by a man. A 1958 article uh, by a woman, which noted that only 32 women had graduated from the University of Washington's architecture program, and only four were currently registered architects. The author questioned why more women hadn't taken up the profession, as women in house plans just naturally seemed to go together. Air was quoted as responding that matrimony was the reason, further noting that architecture is not something you can do before marriage and then come back to after the children are grown. Even with statements like this, I feel that her work uh, to create a professional space for herself allowed other women to follow in the region and her support of female students at the University of Washington, as well as the physical legacy of her work, remain an important part of the story of women in regional construction. Um, the name Irene McGowan may be well known, at least in some design circles, but as far as I was able to find, she has very little written on her. Um, McGowan was born in 1906 and grew up in Northeast Seattle, graduating from Roosevelt High School in 1924. Following high school, McGowan began an apprenticeship with a local lighting company, working alongside a female designer. McGowan would stay there for approximately 13 years, beginning as a drafter and working her way up to a designer, taking advantage of the opportunity to watch the work in-house in the foundry, as well as other company workshops and learning the crafts involved with lighting. In the 1940s, McGowan joined the Henry C. Lind Company as a lighting designer and part owner. The company kept a shop and studio in Seattle. During World War II, the company assisted with construction for the U.S. Navy, and McGowan contributed by drawing electrical plans, primarily for Navy hospitals. She later said that the experience was where she learned about electricity and electrical design. In addition to her design work, McGowan also co-founded the Northwest Designer Craftsman, an organization of crafts artists aimed at generating public interest in crafts, and inspiring high standards of craft in the Northwest. Following her partner's death, McGowan continued to run the company on her own. Along with modern designs, McGowan enjoyed designing pieces utilizing found objects, including wastebaskets, farm implements, and even in one case, a band saw. I love this creative aspect of her work, particularly her ability to take one thing and turn it into something else entirely. 
McGowan went on to have close professional relationships with regional designers, including the partnership with Tecla and Chiarelli at the Seattle Center Opera House, um, the work she did shown here. She also collaborated with Rural and Terry on several projects, including residential designs, as well as Canvas, the iconic Seattle re restaurant. Her work with Terry and other architects exposed McGowan to other designers, and her work went on to be used globally, perhaps most notably at the Kahala Hilton in Honolulu. Her writing designs here include multiple wall sconces, like the one on the right, as well as the centerpiece lobby chandeliers. The one-ton chandeliers McGowan designed for the lobby are still a fixture of the hotel's image, and each feature over 28,000 pieces of beach glass. McGowan's work continues to be desirable and serves as an inspiration for regional designers. The Seattle architecture firm Olson Kumbig credits McGowan's designs as the inspiration for the lighting in their work at the Pierre, which is a residence in the San Juan Islands. The next one we're looking at kind of moves us into another generation. You know, we're moving into women now working in the post-World War II era, primarily. Um, born in 1922, Mary Lynn Davis grew up in Sacramento and graduated from the University of Washington in 1945. As a student, she, did, she interned with local architecture firms, including Chiarelli and Kirk. And these firms were important in developing her appreciation and eye for modernist design. In 1946, Davis became the first female architect to become licensed after World War II. And alongside her design interests, she was also an active sailor and competed in tournaments regionally. Davis primarily designed residences in small commercial buildings. Along with a strong modern aesthetic, one of the things that Davis embraced in her design work that I appreciate is the idea of affordability, highlighting accessible home designs, which were featured in various architecture and design publications, including this home for a Tacoma-based developer, which was featured in Architectural Record, alongside projects by names which are now na nationally and internationally recognized, including Craig Elwood, IMP, and Richard Meyer. Only one other woman designer was featured in this specific issue. Uh, Davis's design was intended to be a low cost house appealing to a range of buyers. The description highlights the use of prefabricated components, an open plan, and standardized post and beam layout, which together makes it easy to construct. Another example of this compact design was the cabin in Furcrest she designed in 1954 for herself and her husband. The 600 square foot design for a couple was described by Marjorie Phillips as having the efficiency of an apartment and the spaciousness of a home. It was highlighted as a home of the month in August 1955. And the home features an open floor plan with a post and beam design, much like the other home. And I think an aesthetic that uh, clearly comes through with both projects. In addition to home and uh, landscape design, Davis worked with her husband uh, to design and build the built-ins and furniture on that project as well as working with the, with the materials at the family-owned Tacoma Millwork Supply Company. She became a regular contributor to the Douglas Fir Plywood Association, which was based in Tacoma, and supplied plans for affordable home designs, as well as you build furnishings. Uh, copies of these documents were distributed nationally, and I feel like her aesthetic clearly aligns with the development of regional modernism, and the focus on a, an affordable design that made that lifestyle more accessible for the middle class, as well as these designs, which I think are just amazing. And looking through them, you know, they look like things we would definitely be purchasing at uh, large modern furniture stores today. Jean Young is a graduate of Wayne State University 
and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She and her husband, Clayton Young, relocated to Seattle in the 1950s. They formed a partnership in 1952, and Jean became licensed in Washington in 1955. Together, their work included residential, commercial, and civic design, and they remained partners until their divorce in 1975, upon which Jean continued to practice on her own. Beyond her built works, I think Young was particularly a significant contributed, contributor to regional architectural activism, particularly in promoting the role of women in design. She contributed to the field through professional service, including as chair of AIA Seattle's Community on Environmental Awareness, and the AIA's Task Force on Women in the Architectural Profession, as a member and chair of Washington's Board of Architectural Registration, as well as serving on both the Seattle Design Commission and the King County Landmarks Commission. I think that this professional service made Young a face for regional architects overseeing events and giving various public presentations. For example, this 1970 Seattle Times article on air pollution uh, Young is quoted as working with the Department of Public Instruction to create a statewide curriculum on the environment. And students were noted to be learning about human behaviors which had contributed to pollution. Um, and a University of Washington student interviewed in this article is noted as being particularly concerned with the recycling of plastics. All of this, and particularly that image from the Space Needle in the newspaper article, particularly resonated with me when I was reviewing some of my research in October, because it looked a lot like it was outside, <laughs> um, although not from vehicular pollution, uh, but from wildfire smoke. I think that Young's professional activism echoes the concerns of many working in the profession today. And I think there's a lot we can take from her as an example in terms of how to portray ourselves to the public, as well as to our uh, other professional designers and, and researchers. An East Coast native, Audrey Van Horn completed graduate level architecture studies at Harvard University School of Design. After initially working in New York City, she and her husband, John, relocated to Seattle in 1948. And they went on to establish a firm in 1951 Audrey worked there as a designer until she became a partner in 1956. The couple continued their partnership until retirement in 2008. Alongside her full-time professional career, Audrey raised five children and spearheaded the development of innovative teaching programs at their schools. In their partnership, Audrey and John Van Horn worked on a range of products, projects, including residential and commercial, and developed a clear modern aesthetic, including what we see here at their own Portage Bay home. The large bank of raised windows faces the water, but from the street, this is all protected by mature tree growth, both at the entry and along the, the long side of their home. I think that um, uh, the garage that's in the back also has a similar, albeit not flat roofed aesthetic to it. And that's where their, off, their home office was. And even though their work uh, eventually covers a range of pro project types, including multifamily residential um, and various public projects, I'm also going to speak about another one of their early works. Uh, the, the paycheck residence in the hilltop community of Bellevue. It was designed for interior designer Patricia Jean Keller and her first husband, former University of Washington football player John Paycheck. The residence is sited on a large lot typical to the mid century hilltop development. While Patricia Keller directed interior design of the home, Audrey and John worked with her to create a residence on a rational grid with open spaces typical of mid-century architectural design. Characteristic of their training and the regional modern residential trends represented in their early work, the two-story house is structured on a grid of wood columns and paired wood beams. 
with large expanses of glass exposing the original outdoor pool and the deep front lawn. Even with mature plantings, Western views from the living room's large glass windows remain open, allowing for glimpses of Mount Rainier, South Seattle, and the Olympic Mountain Range. At least from the street, in my perspective, this house remains largely similar to its original appearance after a significant remodeling projects project in the early 2000s. Although some of its sheathing and, sheathing and openings have been altered. The, the street facing lawn means it's actually one of the most visible hilltop properties, particularly in comparison to the firm's nearby Smith residence, also in hilltop. If anyone knew any of the women today, I think this would be the one. So <laughs> Jane Hastings was born in Seattle and she was a graduate of West Seattle High School. She's an active swimmer and skier through college. And I found particularly the skiing highlighted multiple times in news articles. She studied architecture at the University of Washington, graduating in 1952 and become, becoming licensed in 1953. Hastings worked for a series of local firms before opening her own practice, the Hastings Group, in 1959. The firm focused on residential work, as well as small-scale commercial projects and public buildings. Several of the residential projects were highlighted in the Seattle Times, including as Home of the Month, like the Kwan residence seen here on the left. Another home that was uh, recognized was the home that she designed for herself and her husband, the University of Washington professor, Norman Johnston. The Laurelhurst site that the home is on is an unusual corner lot, and the home forms a long slender rectangle filling the narrower, narrower portion of the site and leaves a large, large, excuse me, a large portion of the lot open for a garden. Hastings design is considered an early example of sustainable design in the region, responding to the site, lighting, and utilizing details which correspond with the Pacific Northwest modern aesthetic. Characterized by multiple roof, roof sheds with a projecting roof monitor, the exterior was originally clad in cedar shingles, and a large multi-story window at the south West elevation bypasses the second floor level and takes advantage of natural lighting in the space, with smaller window openings on the other elevations to minimize heat loss. A thermal chimney provides additional heat at the inner portion of the house, and the covered entry is created by a projecting bay window. Public spaces are split between the entry level and the second story. The kitchen and dining room are on the entry level, which also provides access to a deck and the garden. The second story includes a large living area and nook with small balcony, as well as the master suite. The third floor has an access to a deck with views of Union Bay. The house was recognized by AIA Seattle with an honor award in 1977, and the couple resided there until 1995. Retaining many of its original interior features, the residence was reclad just this summer <laughs> while I was doing this research. Um, but much of, I feel like the, the original form beyond the cladding is still mostly intact. I'm also presenting something that's a little different. Um, so I am a structural engineer. <laughs> uh, so I got excited about seeing a bridge as a project. And I know that this doesn't necessarily represent Hastings core residential work, but I think it does represent her ability to work collaboratively and, um, and to work with multiple designers and, as part of a design team. This is the bridge at Flaming Geyser State Park. It was designed to replace an earlier bridge, which was considered by the county to be inadequate for the, um, the continued roadway use at the popular state park. The design team, which won the award to design a new bridge, included the Hastings Group, structural engineer Victor Gray, landscape architect Richard Hay, and artist George Sutukawa. 
and it's a diverse group of individuals and I imagine you should have our hands full. Um, so the design team sought to create a replacement bridge, which would serve as an entryway to the popular state park, while not overpowering the surrounding natural environment. It was also desired that the new bridge would clear span over the Green River, leaving an unobstructed waterway for salmon and other wildlife. So the solution was this cable stayed bridge, which has a 230 foot center span and 66 foot end spans. Um, it bears on concrete abutments on either side of the river. The bridge opened in 1992 and the structure was recognized with a 1993 AISC Prize Bridge Award and a special honor award from the Washington Aggregates and Concrete Association. In addition to her prolific design career, Hastings was active in social groups as well as professional organizations. Her contributions included serving as the first woman president of Seattle AIA. She was elected to the AIA College of Fellows in 1984 and became the first woman chancellor of the AIA's College of Fellows in 1992. Hastings additionally taught classes at the Seattle Community College as well as the University of Washington. She served on the Council of Design Professionals in Seattle, the Seattle Landmarks Preservation Board, um, as well as the Design and Construction Review Board for the Seattle School District. And I think these, these pictures kind of tell it all. <laughs> um, you know, she's pictured with other women architects, as well as some large names in mid-century uh, regional work. Um, and I particularly like the, the image on the right is her own home uh, prior to the one that we just looked at. This one is in Fremont, and she's standing outside with Art School Nick. Uh, and the article is discussing the um, a class that will be uh, in the continuing education department at the University of Washington titled Northwest Heritage, Preserving Seattle's Past. I think that's <laughs> timely that that's you know, something that she highlights as an interest in these sorts of things. Um, particularly as this is a preservation group and we all have a similar interest in preserving the past. Now, tonight I've highlighted women we mostly know, I think, if, if you know regional design, which I did not coming into this. Um, and I was excited to find some other stories as well. And this is one, and this is Anne uh, Seagal. She was a graduate of Lincoln High School and the University of Washington. She began working at, um, following graduation from the university at McPherson Realty, which was the company her father, William, had established in 1932. And that would ultimately be overtaken by two of her brothers who went on to expand the company beyond its uh, original university district office to cover large parts of both Washington and Oregon. On her own, Sigail chose to move beyond just the realty business to become a contractor, and she built a successful local building firm. Uh, she did much of this uh, as a widow with four young children. Uh, I think that <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that, that's a tale of success and perseverance. She focused primarily on single family residential construction, working with regional architects, notably Elizabeth Ayer and Roland Lampin. Uh, she expanded her work to include some small scale commercial development, including new offices for her family's realty firm and bank buildings. But I think the residential work remained her core area of, um, of expertise including these projects in Berkwood and in this Arden, which were both designed by Air. She felt that uh, women were appropriate to be designing and building things like homes because they're the ones that needed to use them. Um, and she felt that the, the relationship she created, particularly with Air, was um, valuable in a collaboration between contractor and designer. 
Well, this is just one name, and we've looked at several, uh, perhaps more familiar to all, to all of you. I think something to consider beyond these women is that there's many others. Um, some of these are names that I found during my research but was not able to expand on this evening. Some may have been mentioned tangentially, um, or you may be more familiar with their work. But I think that many of their stories are likely just as rich as the ones that are highlighted here. And for me, the, the stories of these women find their inroads into architecture, construction, other design fields, uh, and their contributions in creating uh, and building locally, serving professionally, and maintaining their uh, fully active personal lives uh, all inspire me to continue telling their stories and to. Um, and I hope for all of you uh, to help in rediscovering them um, for our work, both as, I guess, as preservationists, designers, historians, as well as in order for future and current students and designers to find out more about them. Thank you all. All right, fantastic, great. Well, thank you very much, Kristen. If this was uh, an in-person presentation, we'd all be clapping and there would be raucous volume all around, but in the in the terrifying silence of a Zoom room, you'll have to suffice for my, my voice. But very good presentation. I really appreciate hearing your summary of these, of these women designers. And there's so many different little tidbits that come out of the presentation that are just, that are, that are fascinating. Um, so Elizabeth Ayer ruled that it was not okay to have a lion in your home. Is that what I was hearing? That's correct. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I guess that's that's probably a good idea. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So if there are questions that are coming in, I see some of them coming into the chat. So I'll sort of keep up with with those. So I'll, I'll start. Uh, reading down the line. So we see the question, many of these women were working recently enough that there are people who lived or worked with them still alive. Did you get to talk to anyone with those connections? <laughs> um, unfortunately, I did not have that opportunity. I would definitely welcome that opportunity if it presented itself. I know that it may be beyond my uh, expertise <laughs> to be interviewing them, but I, I feel like the people who worked with them are still around this is the opportunity we can't miss is to record these stories. Absolutely. Yeah. That's it's definitely a call to to all of us to to record those stories as they're as they're still out there, as those people are still still there with memories, getting them um, recorded down is important. And Dokomomo Wiwa did have a, a conversation about a year ago with with Jane Hastings, a wonderful interview and an oral history that we were able to record. And that will be uh, available in the in the near future. So that is definitely part of our ongoing work at at Dokomomo. So just moving down, I see Kristen. Though, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. These women are incredible. I'm a writer currently writing a fictional novel set in <laughs> the '60s in Seattle and highlighting a female architect. Wow, perfect. <laughs> the problem is I know nothing. Would I be able to contact you with our specifics about fill in details for my book? Uh, sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, as I noted at the beginning, I am a structural engineer, I'm an architect, but I am, I have, I guess, researched all these women. So I'd be happy to, to speak with you. Yeah. Well, that's, that's found, sounds fantastic. Yes. You certainly have a good sense of the, of the context in which all of these women were designing and, and the, the projects that they were able to, to work on. That's, that's fantastic. Great. See some other praise coming through. Definite appreciations for your your projects. Uh, can you go back to maybe some slides that we could just talk through some of the images of of, of Irene McGowan? Yeah. So she was someone that had had interested a lot of us on the on the Dokomomo board, and she's someone I knew very very little about. Uh, did we want to look at some of her work? Perhaps, yeah, maybe some of those, uh, even just the beach glass chandelier. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and this one as well. So <laughs> you had mentioned that she was fond of using found objects as part mm -hmm. of her, her new designs. And you listed a couple of things she used. Could you just repeat those? Yes. Um, 
Yeah, so um, a good chunk of my information actually came from an interview she did in Architectural Lighting, which is this ah. article that this image came from. And um, in that, she notes that she enjoyed designing pieces uh, utilizing found objects. That's, I guess, my words, but um, some of the things that were noted. This, uh, the term that's used for, I think, the cylindrical pieces in this image are um, Mexican waste baskets. Um, and then she, these are, I think, uh, <laughs> some sort of farm implement. <laughs> um, and there was a really poor image just above it that she actually used a bandsaw to create something. Oh, interesting. The, the image of her, let me go back to this one. On the right, um, the lamp she's holding, although it's a very you know traditional looking historic lamp, she made it using a coffee can and a tuna fish can. Oh. Um, so I think that's, <laughs> I, I just like the creativity that goes into that. Absolutely, um, yeah. And it's a fascinating take on sort of modernism at the time, which really prided itself on new technology, new form, new product industrial processes to have somebody that's looking to found objects as mm -hmm. their design medium is pretty is pretty interesting and, and pretty unique. So this is a beach glass chandelier. Yes. So um, each chandelier has, I guess, 28,000 pieces of beach glass attached to it. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's why they each weigh a ton, a, a, one ton. Um, I, am, I, know that, I know that Eugenia has seen these in person. Um, all the photographs I've seen them, they look beautiful because it's all different colors of beach glass. And I assume perfectly uh, in keeping with a, a Hawaiian resort. Yeah. And certainly yeah. from an age when there was a, a ton of beach glass, <laughs> glass yes. bottles. And I mean, I can see part of her design process being collecting all of these pieces of glass and the curating of those pieces and the color selection going into this design, a fascinating sort of take on, on modernism, which isn't right. all just thin lines and, you know, new steel beams. It's, mm -hmm. there's a, there's an aesthetic here that still makes it incredibly modern, but in a in a different way than we often often see. Well, and maybe maybe if she was working today, she'd be working with plastics. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I, I'm sure. I think that just the idea of reusing things in the new way is, yeah, definitely not what we characterize as modern. At least in right. the middle, the middle of the modern period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. I'll just. I just want to say that um. I took these photos at the Dokomomo U.S. Uh, symposium in Honolulu in 2019 and so this was uh, on one of the tours and it was amazing so uh, thank you Kristen for um, researching Irene McGowan that was a request of mine so I really appreciate learning all about her uh, about her um, I want to Tyler we can go back Holly Taylor had a question early on oh. and it's a I great know. presentation Kristen are there some good candidates for landmark nominations oh. among the extent projects that you looked at uh, I know it's tricky with houses Holly but is that but that's a lot of what I looked at um I definitely think that um you know some of these residences I wish wish we would have this conversation about the Johnston house um, before they reclad the exterior um yeah. but <laughs> um, wind, wind that one back can we just do or have a redo on that um but I mean I think like some of Mary Lynn Davis's designs, like her home, this this is a yeah. photograph I took standing on the corner across the street from it is another modern design. And the neighbor behind this house is another modern design. So I think there's this small collection of homes in her crest that might, that if you, even if on their own, um, mm -hmm. I you know, whether I guess on their own or perhaps as a collection, um, I just, I realize that now this is a multi-million dollar home, but you know, I like the idea that at the time this was not intended to be that. Um, I think also, um, I'm just thinking a lot of uh, Elizabeth Ayer's larger projects have been altered or they're um, maybe more inaccessible. 
Um, sorry, I'm thinking through this. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I I mean, I know Hilltop is a known area of some of this, but it when I was driving through Hilltop over the summer, there definitely was construction going on on some of these properties. And I realized that people have to keep them updated, but I think that as a collection, I'm sure there's a group of houses, including the two Van Horn and Van Horn properties in the Hilltop community mm -hmm. uh, that definitely would be worth considering. Um, as well as Jane Hastings. So um, the Quam residence on the left is one I, I did end up writing about, but it's set back from the street. Uh, so it's very difficult to photograph, but I, um, it's site it, on the, um, overlooking the canal. It's on a really narrow site and the homes around it are being redeveloped right now. So the home right next door even though it looks open in this sketch, is a huge modern house that basically fills the entire lot. And this smaller home is still next to it. And I think that would definitely be worth one looking at. Um, but I'm sure there are dozens of others that I didn't get a chance to visit as well. Mm -hmm. And looks like there was a question from Michael Hauser. Mm -hmm. Are there any buildings designed by women on the local register in Seattle. Mm. Um, I mm. neglected checking on some of these houses. I, uh, the hell, the... I am trying to think. So I, Susan Boyle, I'm gonna put you on the spot. So yeah. Susan is on our board yeah. and she is an, also an architect and she's <laughs> prepared many, many landmark nominations. Um, if any of you out there know I saw that question. This is Susan. I saw that question and it threw me into my my mind's alphabetical list of marks. <laughs> and well, a number of women are associated as having worked with some of the architects. You know, it's the name on the door that mm -hmm. becomes the recognized uh, architect. I mean, for instance, um, Astra Zarina, when she worked with um, or worked for Paul Kirk, that's one that I know of. Um, and then too, I think it's interesting. So many of the women, the work that you're showing are residential projects and those I think are, are fewer yeah. represented in, in, um, as yeah. landmarks in the city. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's it. when Holly asked the question, that's what I was thinking as well as, I think there's a, maybe perhaps a, a larger hurdle to landmarking residences in some cases. Mm. Um, we don't think to landmark them because we're living on them. Maybe <laughs> yeah. that's a good question, Michael. There's a gap there that we recognize. I think we need to. <laughs> we should work on that. Um, thank you, Barbara Johns. Um, thank you for attending. You have a couple comments here. Some really good um, resource recommendations. David Martin. Yes, he's he is a great resource. Um, and you mentioned you also knew Mary Lent Davis as well. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Marga uh, mentioned women now have about 20% of licensed or about 20% licensed architects in Washington. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, great. And Betsy Smith, you're a Hilltop resident. That's wonderful. Um, which uh, architect designed, I'm sure, <laughs> if you'd like to type it in the chat or maybe unmute, you could, you could mention. Uh, um, which house is is yours the the other Van Horn and Van Horn house perhaps? Uh, no, no. Um, David uh, uh, is the last name of the of the uh, architect is Smith. I can't remember his first name right now. Oh, okay. And and he, this was the only house he built up here. Of course, we've got many of them by everybody else, including mm -hmm. the one you showed. Carol Smith. Excuse me, this is Barbara. Oh, I'm not forgetting my 70 years is catching up with me. Um, I can't remember his first name right now, but he had done another residence uh, on down in Seattle. But other than that, he did um, uh, commercial buildings. Interesting, right? Yeah. Well, we've um, over the years, we've done three tours of Hilltop in the past. They were wonderful and um, uh, they were very well attended and one of our favorite places in, in the area. Um, I wanted to, yeah, are there other questions? 
If not, um, thank you. If Kristen, would you mind kind of moving to the last slide? Of course. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks for moderating. <laughs> and thank you for the time that you spent working with uh, Kristen on this project. And we're hoping to do, um, so you know, last summer we worked with uh, Sierra Miles on the Benjamin, Benjamin McAdoo research project and then this summer with Kristen. So we're hoping to do this to work with a student every summer, a new research topic. And, um, and it, it's just really exciting to, to, to have this work done and we, we the idea is to expand our uh, content on our website. <laughs> and, um, and so this, this will definitely help with that. So we appreciate your work, Kristen. And thank you for the great presentation. A lot of kudos in the chat. And um, I'm going to put in the chat of something of reference. This is something I learned about relatively recently. It's called um, Pioneering Women of, America, of American Architect. And I'm going to put the website in the chat. Um, so there are podcasts. Um, so the Beverly Willis uh, Foundation produced th these. And so there are biographies and there are podcasts. And definitely check them out. They recently won an award of excellence in advocacy from Doco Mobile US. And, um, and it's, a, uh, it's a really great resource. So I'll put the link in here. There it is. Um, and those little three little dots there, if you want to save the chat, you can just click on that and save the chat and you can have that link. Um, but uh, so yeah, so thank you all for attending this evening. And uh, if you, uh, you're probably already on our mailing list, this is probably how you learned about this program or you went on our Facebook page. We, um, we are an all volunteer organization, uh, all volunteer board, and we do education and advocacy. And coming up, we're very excited for our first in-person holiday gathering since 2019. Yay! <laughs> so, and it's going to be at Porchlight Coffee on Capitol Hill. And it's our kind of combination annual meeting and holiday party. And we're going to have a brief presentation from Tom Heuser and Lana Blinderman on the second phase of their Capitol Hill Modern Project. And so, so um, some of you may have attended their virtual program uh, last year on that. They've been doing walking tours as well. So we're excited and Porch Light is a great place um, and uh, we're excited to, to have that there. And so stay tuned with more information on that. There is gonna be limited capacity. So hopefully we'll be able to figure that out. But um, I think that's kind of all we have. Uh, Tyler, anything you wanna add? Nope. We're yeah. excited for the end of the year, excited for the holiday party, and thank everyone for, for coming and being a part of our Docomomo US WeWa community. Definitely. In addition to Susan, we also have um, Andy Phillips, who's also a board member. He he was here earlier. And thank you all of you. I see a lot of uh, names that we recognize. I really appreciate your spending the evening, and uh, hopefully, clearly Zoom fatigue hasn't totally set in yet. So, But uh, we do have a YouTube channel, so this will be up loaded onto that. Um, you could catch our past ones, Capitol Hill Modern, the Benjamin McAdoo talk, and also uh, um, uh, one on Paul Kirk as well. So um, Kristen, any, any final words? <laughs> no, I just thank you all again um, for the opportunity to, to research some of these women that are all new to me. Um, I realize they may not have been new to you. Um, so it was great to be able to spend part of my summer both researching them as well as going out and learning the area because I'm not from Seattle. So um, it, learning the area by visiting some of their projects. So thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you all for listening this evening. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Kristen. And I love that you started with Julia Morgan. She is one of my favorite architects and I'm a Californian. So, <laughs> but anyway, all right. Thank you everyone. Have a good evening and we'll uh, hopefully see you uh, at our upcoming holiday party. If not, definitely at some event in the future. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.